How did a bothersome eager beaver take 41,140 vehicles and solve a military strategic problem in 46 days that Germany couldn't solve in all of World War I? We look at the Manstein Plan and Panzergruppe Kleist. This is the Principles of War podcast, professional military education for junior officers and senior NCOs. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to episode 72 of the Principles of War podcast. This is the last episode of our Center of Gravity series looking at the four centers of gravity for the Battle of France. Last week, we left the Wehrmacht having just conquered Poland and being left with the insidious problem of dealing with war with Great Britain and France. They needed time to refit But they couldn't take too long because the Royal Navy blockade was denying them the resources that they needed. What was the solution to the problem of how to defeat the French army? Arguably the best army in the world. OKH, the German Army High Command, starts a planning process to develop the solution. To find out how they get there, we need to go back to the Schlieffen Plan. And to find out how they got to the Schlieffen Plan, we need to go back a little bit further in time. We need to go back to 216 BC to the Battle of Cannae. Cannae, which we've covered in previous podcasts, sees Hannibal, the invader, into Roman territory, facing multiple Roman legions. And it's the third of the three decisive defeats that Hannibal inflicts on the Romans after Lake Trasimene and Trebica. In Western military thinking, Cannae is seen as the acme of excellence. Traditionally, battles at that time were fought with strong centres and weaker flanks. Hannibal creates the mirror image of this. His centre is fairly weak. He has stronger infantry on the flanks and then cavalry further out from the his strong infantry. He is much stronger in cavalry than are the Romans. He uses this cavalry on the left-hand side to defeat the smaller Roman cavalry, then goes around right around the rear of the Roman legions, defeats the Roman cavalry on their left flank. While Hannibal's cavalry has been destroying the Roman allied cavalry, the Hannibal's centre has been pushed backwards. However, his stronger infantry out on the flanks has been been able to maintain their position. And so a bulge has developed into Hannibal's lines. The further the Roman infantry push forward, the further they are enveloped by the Carthaginian infantry. And the cavalry, the Carthaginian cavalry, is able to close the back door on the Roman infantry. The Roman legions are compressed tighter and tighter and tighter. They're unable to manoeuvre and they are slaughtered over a period of hours. A stunning victory for Hannibal. In 1870, Moki the Elder had been able to complete the Cannae of the 19th century in the Battle of Sedan, where an entire French army was surrounded and captured. In February 1891, Count Alfred von Schlieffen was appointed to the post of the chief of the Grosser General Staff, or the Great General Staff. Under him, a series of plans were developed annually for the contingency of a war against France. Once again, the problems with Germany's geography came to the fore, with the necessity to defeat France as quickly as possible to avoid fighting a war on two fronts. An invasion of France was seen as difficult because of the fortifications that they had on their border, and hence the hook around to the right flank through Belgium and Luxembourg, then to be able to sweep down to the south and capture not a French army, but the entire French army as the German forces moved down to the Swiss border. The French had a policy of all-out attack, and they were very keen to regain the territory in Alsace-Lorraine. A key part of the Schlieffen plan was that almost 90% of the German military power was to be in this right hook that would move through Belgium and Luxembourg. The French, attacking through Alsace-Lorraine, were to face only 12% of the German army. 
Schlieffen hoped that the French would do him the favour of invading through Alsace-Lorraine. The further they pushed through, the further they would be into the trap that he was setting for them. Strategically, the Germans were able to surprise the Allies by moving through Belgium and Luxembourg. Not only were the French surprised by this move, but they were also proceeding exactly as the Germans had hoped. They were attacking through the Alsace-Lorraine area. I'll defer now to Fries's cutting critique of what happened with the Germans next. He describes the French movement into Alsace-Lorraine as setting in motion the gigantic machinery that Schlieffen had planned and that was bound to lead to its annihilation. Now, the Germans, quite incomprehensibly, refused to accept this gift. One of the biggest military stupidities of the century took place along the border of Alsace-Lorraine. The French pushed into the pocket planned by Schlieffen, but the Germans on the left wing, again with all their might, kicked the attackers out after they had voluntarily plunged into the abyss of perdition. Joffre's offensive failed after just a few kilometres and his troops were forced back behind the border fortifications. In that way, the execution of the Schlieffen plan in 1914 was turned into a satire of the Battle of Cannae, with the right wing obviously not knowing what the left was doing. Astonishingly enough, the discussion of the Schlieffen plan to this very day is fixated mostly on the right wing. Schlieffen's successor, Moltke the Younger, had reduced the force ratio between the two wings from 7 to 1 to 3 to 1. In reality, however, the decisive mistake was not to weaken the right wing, but rather to strengthen the left wing. The formations employed here had now become so strong that the French attackers were no longer able, as Schlieffen had wanted, to push deeply enough into Lorraine. On the contrary, the Bavarian Crown Prince's spontaneous counterattack on the left wing was diametrically opposed to the revolving door movement that Schlieffen had wanted. And so the operational level logic of the Schlieffen plan was reduced to absurdity. Schlieffen was prepared to accept the risk of the French plunging into Alsace-Lorraine because of the fact it was going to support that right hook. Part of the reason of the reallocation of the forces onto the left wing of, of the German army was the concerns about ceding territory to the French, even though that French movement was critical in the success of the plan. The failure of the Schlieffen plan made the German high command that much more concerned about any of these big, one-shot, no-reserve kind of plans. They favoured a more methodical approach to war, sequencing campaigns, the problem being that they didn't have the time to be able to construct enough campaigns to be able to defeat the French. On top of that, strategic surprise was going to be highly unlikely, given the fact that the French and British had declared war on Germany. Operational surprise generated by that right hook was highly unlikely because it had already been tried, and the French were likely to be expecting it. In fact, that is what they wanted. That was the reason why they'd built the Maginot Line, so that they could fight the next war not on French territory and protect their vital industrial areas. In response to the Führer directive, OKW produced a plan that saw a replay of the Schlieffen plan, and Hitler himself, even though he directed it, said this is going to be no good, it is just a replay of the Schlieffen plan. And the German general saw that it was going to end up with strength against strength. That would be far too attritionalist for the Germans to be able to win. It was Erich von Manstein who came up with the plan of, instead of having Army Group B conduct the right hook... Having the main effort being Army Group A punching through the French defences in the Maginot Line, and instead of turning to the south, they would turn to the north, all the way to the coast. This would see the encircling of the entire northern Allied wing. OKH, the Army High Command, rejected his plan because it was absurd and dangerous. Many of our professional listeners will be familiar with the concept of the CHUT, the tactical exercise without troops, where a problem is given and you need to come up with a plan that is going to be able to solve that problem. For all of us 
who have had a plan labelled as absurd and dangerous and only workable with major modifications, I think that there's a small amount of comfort that we can draw on. I'm not saying that I've ever had a plan that's been as good as Manstein's. Mine have probably been significantly less uh, gifted. But it does highlight the difficulty of analysing plans when it isn't being conducted on actual operations, and particularly when it is being judged against doctrine, and that doctrine is subject to an environment that is changing dramatically. And this is exactly what we see in 1939. Everything in this plan hinged on the Allies moving into Belgium to fight the battle there. What Manstein was attempting to do was to create a revolving door effect where the best Allied troops would move into that pocket and then be caught by Army Group B punching up to the mouth of the Somme and pinning them against the coast. Liddell Hart compared this with a bullfight. Army Group B was to play the role of the Matador's cape. It was to draw the Allies in, allow them to become decisively engaged whilst their flank was being turned at an operational level. The first deployment directive had Army Group B as the main effort, and the ratio of divisions was 37 to 26. This sees main effort against main effort. By the 10th of May, this force ratio had changed to 45 to 29 in favour of Army Group A. Critically, Army Group A had seven of the 10 Panzer divisions, and of the 42 divisions that were in reserve, most of them were to reinforce Army Group A as it punched through the Maginot Line. In 1914, the Schlieffen Plan had been watered down to the point of absurdity, and the Germans made sure that they didn't make this mistake again. They ensured that the main effort, Army Group A, would be able to generate the combat power and force ratios that were required to punch through the French defences. Army Group B would have 29 divisions. They would face off against 60 Allied divisions from the Dutch, Belgium, French and British armies. Army Group A would enjoy a ratio of 45 to 18 against the defenders. As we discussed in our episode on the Maginot Line, one of its requirements was to provide a robust defence whilst decreasing the manpower requirements. Despite this, it was defended by 36 divisions of the French Army, and they were facing only 19 divisions from the German Army Group C. This means that in total, 135 German divisions, of which 93 were in the first wave, were to attack a total of 151 Allied divisions. As Frieser notes in his book, but because the Wehrmacht, as the attacker, had the initiative and determined the point of main effort, it was possible to convert the absolute superiority of the Allies along the entire front line into a relative German superiority in the sector of the front line where the operational decision was to be made. Still, the operations plan entailed an enormous risk because everything depended on whether the opponent would actually make his contribution to getting the revolving door going. In an upcoming episode, we're going to talk about how they developed the deal plan and the breeder variant of that. And also, we're going to discuss how the Germans knew about that plan because that gave them the confidence to execute Manstein's concept of operations despite the risks that it entailed. The process by which OKW went from that first deployment directive through to the final execution of the Manstein plan is fascinating because there was so much resistance to it internally within the German army. Manstein's development of his plan commenced with his critique of the first deployment directive. In that, he said that an offensive with a reinforced right wing would lead to a frontal clash with the main forces of the enemy. Schwerpunkt would clash with Schwerpunkt. The result of this struggle that was to be fought on the tactical echelon at best could lead to a partial operational success. But the important thing was not to force the enemy frontally behind the Somme River, but rather to cut him off in his rear along the Somme and to encircle him. That was the only way one could achieve a decisive victory on the strategic level. 
It was precisely the successive course of an offensive on the right wing that would be bound to invite the enemy to mount a counter blow. The farther Army Group B advanced along the Channel Coast, the more easily the French Army would be able to thrust into the ever longer exposed flank from the south. Frieza writes in Blitzkrieg Legend, Manstein's alternate plan seemed so astonishingly simple because both problems could be solved simultaneously with a single step. He called for the point of main effort to be shifted from Army Group B in the north to Army Group A in the centre. Strong panzer units were to attack where they would be least expected, through the presumably impassable Ardennes woods. If it was possible to cross the Meuse River at Sedan by way of a surprise attack, then the way would be cleared to the solution of both problems in operational terms. 1. After the successful breakthrough at Sedan, fast panzer formations were to push into the rear areas of the Allied front all the way to the mouth of the Somme. In that way, the enemy's entire northern wing would be trapped along the Channel Coast in one gigantic pocket. 2. The breakthrough at Sedan would be at the same time provide the operational point of departure for solving the problem of providing flank protection in an offensive manner. One field army was to thrust southward into the anticipated deployment area of the enemy counterattack before the latter could get going. For me, this is where the intellectual power of Manstein is best on display. He has gone through the wargaming process. He's identified the risks with his plan, and it is that flank. He's looked at the likely enemy dispositions, what they are most likely to do, and that has enabled him to come up with a plan where he actually strikes into the assembly areas of the French as they're getting ready to strike to that flank. Rather than waiting for the infantry to come and secure the point of the breach into the French line, he seizes the offensive and strikes into the assembly area before the French are ready to attack. This is the genesis of the Sickelschnitt, the sickle cut idea. There is an interesting quirk of fate that allowed for the rapid maturation and development of the concept of operations for the sickle cut. And that is that the headquarters of Army Group A, where Manstein developed the sickle cut, was on the bank of the Rhine. It was very close to the headquarters of 19th Corps, which was to go on to become Panzer Corps Guderian. Also, the two generals were billeted in hotels that were next to each other. Manstein, the strategic genius, was able to confer extensively with Guderian, who would execute his plan. Guderian had also advanced through the Ardennes Forest in 1914. Not only that, but in 1918, he attended a four-week general staff training course in Sedan. So he was quite familiar with the terrain. He knew what the terrain was like, and he was able to envisage how he would be able to move tanks through such constricted terrain. With the approval of von Rundstedt, he drafted seven memos in total to army headquarters. Franz Halder, who was the chief of the general staff at Army High Command, made fun of Manstein's plan, thinking them completely impractical and bearing far too much risk. Most importantly, OKH refused to pass it on to OKW, or Wehrmacht High Command. The first victim of the Manstein plan was to be Manstein himself. Halder, who was becoming increasingly fed up with his planning, viewed him as a bothersome eager beaver, and he used the opportunity to promote him to get him out of the way. He convinced von Rundstedt that Manstein should be promoted to command an army corps, and he was given command of the 38th Army Corps. What should normally be a very exciting time in a officer's career wasn't as exciting as it should be because 38th Army Corps was actually a corps only on paper and it was a long way from the Western Front. Even though Manstein was no longer there to champion his idea, it was wargamed and on the 7th of February, Franz Halder started to warm to the idea of the sickle cut. More importantly, two of his staff, Blumentritt and von Treskow, were unhappy with the way that he'd been pushed out of the tent for the planning. And when Hitler's chief military aide came to see Army Group A, he met with von Treskow, who he had served with in the 9th Infantry Regiment. 
they told him of the Manstein plan. This is where things start to get interesting. Hitler had also been thinking about a breakthrough at Sedan. However, OKW had been continually trying to get him to forget the idea. Now that they knew that there was a plan for a breakthrough at Sedan, it was important to arrange a meeting. And so a working breakfast for the new corps commanders and Erwin Rommel, who was newly promoted to be the commander of the 7th Panzer Division, was organised. Frieser describes what happens next. When the conference was over, Hitler was asked von Manstein to follow him to his office. Only Jodl and Schmund participated in the conference, along with the two main characters. Normally, Hitler had the rather unpleasant habit of interrupting the briefings given by his generals after a short time to embark upon one of his feared monologues. This time, he listened to Manstein's briefing silently and as if transfixed. Impressed by the general's captivating line of argument, he also managed to hide the personal aversion that he had for otherwise entertained against von Manstein. Instead, he turned out to be enthusiastic and agreed to all of von Manstein's conclusions, even the employment of strong panzer forces. The die was cast and the sickle cut plan had prevailed. Hitler made his decision that the main effort would be moved to moving through the Ardennes Forest, and that decision was passed through to Army High Command. By this time, Halder had already come around to the idea of the sickle cut. And this was because of the methodical way that he thought about problems and the map exercises that had been conducted. There was a meeting on the 18th of February, and that resulted in the fourth deployment directive. This was the plan for Falgelb, and it reads, the Schwerpunkt of the attack to be mounted across the territory of Belgium and Luxembourg is south of the liege Carillon line. Army Group B had the mission of attacking north of that line to draw as many elements of the French army as possible toward it. 18th Army was to push into Holland. 6th Army was to cross the Meuse at Liege and attack through northern Belgium. Army Group A had the mission of crossing the line of the Meuse River between Sedan and Dinan with the operational probing attack by armoured and motorised elements and of pushing towards the mouth of the Somme River. Fourth Army was to attack south of the Liege Namur line and cross the Meuse River on both sides of Dinan. Twelfth Army was to advance through southern Belgium and Luxembourg, crossing the Meuse in the Sedan sector. Second Army initially had the mission of following the offensive, echeloned in depth to take over the sector in front that was freed after Fourth and Twelfth Armies had veered off towards the Channel Coast. 16th Army was to seal off the left flank of the penetration south of Sidon. The main effort of Army Group C in the southern sector was geared towards the defensive. This was to simulate attacks against the Maginot Line across the way and thus tie down the strong enemy formations. In his memoirs, Manstein describes the innovation process that the sickle cut went through. Naturally, I did not immediately find myself presented with a cut-and-dried operation plan in that October of 1939. Hard work and endeavour must always confront the ordinary mortal before he attains his goal. No ready-made works of art can spring from his brain, as did Pallas Athene from the head of Zeus. He was, however, the one general in OKW or OKH who was able to conceive of a plan that would meet the strategic requirements that had been thrust upon OKW by the declaration of war by France and Britain. He was able to see and conceive a way that the changes in technology would enable him to develop an operational plan that would have a strategic outcome. The politics within the German high command is really interesting to observe as well. Manstein's initial plan didn't call for the Schwerpunkt to be panzer heavy, and that was because he states that the plan was developed at a point in time, and he didn't want to request all of the panzers that were available because of fear that Army Group B would be worried that they'd be losing their panzers. It was only when the fourth deployment directive came out that that main effort would have that panzer thrust built in. The next issue in developing this plan was the time factor. Guderian was concerned about the time that would be available for the offensive to be conducted. Phase one, 
The Meuse River had to be crossed at the latest on the fifth day of the offensive. Otherwise, the French would be able to move reserves up to the river in time, the moment they figured out the deception manoeuvre represented by the sickle cut. Phase two, after crossing the Meuse River, the Panzer divisions had to push to the mouth of the Somme River as quickly as possible, disregarding their exposed flanks, otherwise the Allies would still be able to escape the trap in time. Getting to the Meuse was thought impossible within five days, but indeed they were actually able to do it in four days, which was lucky because they only beat the defending French by a couple of hours to seizing and holding that decisive terrain. Guderian's arguments would persuade Hulda to formulate the attack plan with the panzers out in front rather than having them supported by the infantry and waiting for the infantry to come up and to secure the breach. However, Hulda wasn't won over completely. Whilst he was keen for the attack to be led by the Panzers, he didn't want them to continue on after the Meuse had been crossed. Hulda received a lot of criticism for his support of the Sickle Cut plan, and he was described as the gravedigger of the Panzer force before the invasion. Frieser describes how the most vehement criticism came from General Oberst Fedel von Brock, the Commander-in-Chief of Army Group B. He stopped in on Holder in the latter's Berlin apartment and implored him to drop the absurd, absurd plan. In the process, he reproached Holder for playing with Germany's destiny. The arguments he cited in this connection sounded entirely plausible. You'll be creeping by 10 miles from the Maginot Line with the flank of your breakthrough and hope that the French will watch inertly. You are cramming the mass of the tank units together into the sparse roads of the Ardennes mountain country, as if there was no such thing as air power, and then you hope to be able to lead an operation as far as the coast with an open southern flank 200 miles long, where stands the mass of the French army. He declared that this transcends the frontiers of reason. All of these are really valid criticisms of the plan, but the problem with von Bock is that he doesn't have a better answer to the problem. He's not understanding the temporal pressure that the Wehrmacht is under, the need to defeat France and to defeat it quickly. Frieser then writes, and this is critical to the centre of gravity analysis, the sickle cut could come off successfully only if all the money were placed on one card, the Panzer Force. The moment Manstein had been removed from his post, headquarters, Army Group A, was scared by its own courage and, so to speak, wanted to plan a blitzkrieg in slow motion. The decisive question now was this, should the panzer or infantry divisions lead the attack? Blumentritt, the operations officer of the general staff of Army Group A, claimed that the motorised formations were to be left behind the infantry divisions to do the fighting, and the panzer force to be used only after the tactical breakthrough had been made and where the German forces had gained freedom of action. Frieser then goes on to sum up the sickle cut gamble very eloquently. Manstein's sickle cut plan has again and again been misinterpreted in military historiography. Looking at it carefully, it is more than just an operational plan. It is actually the substitute for a strategic solution that the political leadership failed to develop. That also explains its astonishing similarity to the Schlieffen plan. Great Britain and France declared war, but they had remained mostly passive in spite of the German attack on Poland. They had no need for seizing the initiative on the operational echelon because, protected by the mighty fortifications, they could calmly wait for the economic effects of their naval blockade. After all, they knew that time in the long run would work for them, just as it had in World War I. The image of the fortress besieged by the world was now conjured up again in Germany. Only an attempt at the operational level sally out of the fortress could save it from being starved out strategically in time. Thus, Manstein developed his revolutionary plan. He believed he had discovered the operational gap whose exploitation could bring about the immediate strategic battle of decision, all sceptical predictions to the contrary. But that plan looked like an adventure. After all, it was connected with a tremendous risk, as the reproach was made, because the fate of the Reich was to depend on the outcome of a single operation. Because politician Hitler was playing with this go-for-broke game and had thus manoeuvred Germany into a catastrophic strategic situation, 
all of the General Officer Corps could do was to play the operational go-for-broke game. Thus pushed to the brink, there was only one way out, flight forward. The sickle cut plan, therefore, does not appear as the result of a long-planned expansion-orientated Blitzkrieg strategy aimed at world rule. Instead, it looks like an operational-level act of desperation to get out of the strategically desperate situation. Germany was well aware of what the impact of a naval blockade would be and how it would impact their economy and their ability to fight the war. This meant that strategically, the war was already lost. This is what enabled them to justify any risk that could be taken at the operational level. Tactically, these risks were only magnified. However, there was no alternative. Franz Halder, who had slowly, methodically analysed the problem, commented to von Bock, even if the operation only had a 10% chance of success, I would stick to it. It alone will lead to the enemy's annihilation. For Germany to defeat France quickly, the entity that was only ever going to be capable of doing that was Panzergruppe Kleist. It had the capability of moving quickly enough to create the C2 moral collapse that was a requirement for this battle. It would be able to move fast enough to be able to punch through the defences and move into the undefended terrain toward the rear of the main defensive line. The way that the assault by Panzergruppe Kleist was planned and executed, in particular by Heinz Guderian, would lead to the concept of Blitzkrieg. And this would literally be Doctrine on the Run, the development of which is going to be a fascinating story for us to look at. However, the fruits of victory for the Wehrmacht in mid-1940 were to have a bitter aftertaste. Indeed, when Blitzkrieg was tried against the Soviet Union with no Channel Coast to pin the enemy against, and an enemy with far greater numbers, far more aggressive leadership, far greater manufacturing capacity, and far more territory to trade for time, the Blitzkrieg would be found wanting. OKW did not realise that the Blitzkrieg victory was the result of of the opportunities that came about because of the relationship between the German operational art and the French C2 morale and doctrine. Those relationships and those opportunities would not be found in enough quantities in the East to see the Wehrmacht through to victory. The Principles of War podcast is brought to you by James Ealing. The show notes for the Principles of War podcast are available at www theprinciplesofwar.com for maps, photos and other information that didn't make it into the podcast. Follow us on Facebook or tweet us at Surprise Podcast. If you've enjoyed this podcast, please leave a review on iTunes and tag a mate in on one of our episodes. All opinions expressed by individuals are those of those individuals and not of any organisation.